Praise the Lord. It's so good to be in God's presence once again. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. What I wanted to look at today kind of goes with the theme of what we've been talking about for a couple of weeks. And this morning I was thinking about how important it is that we're anchored, that our souls are anchored, that our, that our thoughts are anchored. And this was the first scripture that came to my mind here in chapter 6 of Hebrews. Notice verse 10. For God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name, and having ministered and still ministering to the saints. You know, it's that's something that's really important to think about, that God is not unjust. He is just, and he never forgets anything that he asks us to carry. He never forgets any sacrifice that we ever, we ever give to him. And he always remembers every promise that he's made. And so, you know, that's one of the things that I, I was thinking quite a bit about Blake's message about how, you know, your one thing has to be sanctified in the Lord that it because it might be that everything else is taken away God may ask that of you and and you know as pastor makes clear when you come to Christ that is the decision that you have to make you can't it's not really a union if you don't do that so of course you have to you know you've got to settle that in your mind that you that you are a sacrifice and that God is trustworthy for you to do that. You'll never sustain it if you don't always come back to that anchor point, that God is just. He's not unjust. He's always good. And so, you know, he says, the, the love which you have shown toward his name, you know, the work that we do is in that. It's in the love that we show. That's that's the gift that he's given us to minister with. And so we do that and we can continue to do that. You see, you know, Paul was explaining, you want to encourage each other and even more as the day draws near. You know, it's something that grows and you, you become more capable in doing it. In verse 11, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. You know, no one hopes for what they see. You hope for what you don't see, and you, and you, you anticipate it. You know, you expect the Lord to always do what is best. And we're pressing on to try to have the full assurance of hope because we all have a measure of hope, you know, depending, and that differs from day to day. But what God is offering is the full assurance. I always think of, of Abraham's example on how he, he believed God. Obviously he did because he left everything that he knew and went out to live in the unknown. Abraham was willing to, to let his life be uncertain, depending on the Lord. Wanting, it was better for him to have what he knew in this life be unknown so that he could know God. And I always love the way that it, that it the, the story shows that initially when the promise came, you know, there was a certain amount of belief, but it grew over time and over the years it finally grew enough that it was stronger than the doubt and Abraham believed God and received the promise and so that's in verse 12 he says so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises and so Thinking about that, you, you know, Pastor was mentioning how important it is, what it is we meditate, because you do meditate. You, it's, 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 uh, it's involuntary. For you to meditate on the right things is what takes the work. Like you, everyone knows what it's like to have 
anxious thoughts and worries and you know the cares of the world to just like consume your mind it's that's the normal that's that that's just human nature but for us we are you know it's in the same way that when we come before the lord we we're, we're able to push aside what it is that our natural mind is thinking so that we can listen to what he says and you do that in your thought life too in the same way that you you don't want to have anything that you're dwelling on that isn't true. Only what God has said is what you're going to allow to be cultivated because whatever stays is, is going to be cultivated and it's going to get strengthened. And you don't want to strengthen things that aren't true. You don't want to strengthen things that aren't good. Uh, but they, they will if you're not meditating on what's right. And so the examples that we have, those that have, you know, you go through the, chapter 11 and you see all the people that they led lives of faith and how important it is that we have those examples and we can consider them and that's how we become imitators of those who you know through faith and patience they inherited the promise now in verse 13 he says for when god made the promise to abraham since he could swear by no one greater he swore by himself saying i will surely bless you and i will surely multiply you you know, there's the thing about a promise from God. When he says it, it's already done. He has said it, and it will be accomplished. We live in time, so, you know, we're waiting on it to be made manifest. But, you know, in the same way that we believe through the Scripture that because of Jesus receiving the scourging on our behalf, we are healed. We won't always see it in every moment of time, but it doesn't change the fact that it is true. It's more true than anything else. God's word is more true than anything else. So when he says, surely I will bless you and I will surely multiply you, 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 you anchor your hope to that, that it's, it's something that is assured. And whether there's an interesting thing that, that there's a trust and a love that's cultivated for the Lord in that time of waiting if you had just received everything immediately, you wouldn't appreciate him the same way, if that makes sense. Verse 15, and thus having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. And so, you know, we're, we're striving to be people that think in that way, that we are waiting patiently to attain the promise. But more than that, uh, seeking after the Lord's presence more than receiving answers for need. Because the Lord's presence is always available, and that should be a higher priority for us. You know, you, you don't want to withhold your praise until you receive what it is that you're asking for. It's a much, much better decision and a much more wholehearted way of living to, to never withhold that worship from the Lord, that whether or not, it's like Job said, though he slay me, I will praise him. That's, that's, the, that's the best way to live. And now over in chapter 13, you don't ever want to be thinking in a way like you're undecided about the Lord, because he's not, he's not undecided about us. He made the decision even before he created this world that he would bring us to himself and so we owe him our best attempt at doing the same here in chapter 13 notice verse 5 he himself has said i will never desert you i will never forsake you so that we can confidently say the lord is my helper i will not be afraid what shall man do to me and you know i think of psalm 23 where David says, he just makes this simple statement, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm not going to be in want. There may be circumstances that look like want. Could be the case, often it is. But, you know, that's, that's, um, that's a secondary thing. You know, it's not, it's not enough to persuade us to doubt the Lord. Now, in 1 Peter...
chapter three. Peter gives us an instruction on how to put the Lord first. And I love the way that he words it here in chapter three, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. You know, I've mentioned before, the, the instruction not to fear is repeated more than any other. So when you realize that, you pay attention because God is emphasizing it. It's, it's important. And Peter here ties it to patiently enduring. So he's saying, you know, even if, if you have to endure some things for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. There's a, there's a blessing that goes along with it. God is not unjust. There's always the blessing that comes along with it. And then he says, but don't fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. You know, it, it's, um, well, it's very scary circumstances the people he's writing to are living in at this time and very easy to be intimidated. But we have, we have the hope that we can anchor ourselves to so that we don't stay in that state of mind. You know, as we heard last week, there's a, God has, he's made a provisions for us so that, you know, we can have a sound mind. Notice verse 15, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. You know, that's, that's kind of another way of saying like, put, decide to put him first. Decide in your heart of hearts that the Lord is first. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks of you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. You know, I read it put really well about hope. Uh, I can't remember who it was that wrote it, but they said that those with hope will always have the best influence. You know, the, the amount of hope that you cultivate is, uh, it's gonna be borne out in the effect that you have in whatever situations you're gonna face. And it will be a benefit to the people around you. You know, the, the I, I had mentioned before the idea of being at the table with the Lord, you've, you've got a certain reach that you have that can be a blessing to everyone else that is uh, around you. And so here, I like that Peter is saying, you know, in the midst of all these things, people are going to look at you and they're going to say, they're going to be, they're going to question how it is that you have the hope that you do because it'll be an uncommon thing. It's not normal. You know, you, we all run into that from time to time where people are asking you, you know, it's like, why is it that you're different? Why do you, why do you treat people the way that you do? You know, like what, what, what is it that you're doing different that makes you this way? And, you know, really they're just, they're coming in contact with the presence of God. They're coming in contact with his nature that you are allowing to be developed. But, you know, it's got to be, the only way that it will be developed is if, you know, the, the, the hope is anchored in the right way. Psalm 112 has a really good section that I wanted to look at. You know, there's always a benefit and a blessing to everything that God does. And the best way to live is to live with, a, with an attitude of faith and expecting that the Lord will do better than what you could hope for, because that is the reality. You know, I believe that the Lord always chooses the best. You know, he's, he always chooses what he could, the best possible thing that he could do with us. And 
his, you know, his every motivation is, is, is complete love. And here in Psalm 112, verse 4, Light arises in the darkness for the upright. The Lord is gracious and compassionate and righteous. It is well with the man who is gracious and lends. He will maintain his cause and judgment, for he will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. You know, there's the understanding that we have that we are going to be remembered just in the same way that we look at these, these cloud of witnesses. We see that, you know, what Paul was pointing out is like, you, because you know that, you, this cloud of witnesses is surrounding you, you press on in the way that they did because you're going to be part of that. You're going to be part of that for the people that come behind you. You know, a life that, that leaves footprints behind you that people can follow and that will lead them closer to the Lord is, you know, that's the, that's the most noble aim that there is. And he says here in verse 7, He will not fear evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is upheld, and he will not fear. And he looks with satisfaction on his adversaries. You know, we're not too focused on our adversary. He's going to do what he's going to do. But, you know, we rejoice that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But God does mention a few times that uh, he will deal with our adversaries. And we will look with satisfaction on them. And that's, and that's good to know. We don't get caught up in that too much uh, because, you know, our, our, our eyes are on the Lord. But it is, it's, that's part of anchoring your hope is knowing that uh, the one who is to blame will be held accountable. Now, in 2 Corinthians, just quickly... Second Corinthians chapter two. There's a, a statement that Paul makes that's really good to take to heart in verse 14. And just before this, you know, he was talking about how when they came to this area in Troas, uh, he mentioned that he had no rest in his spirit because he couldn't find Titus, his brother, and and so you know he was. Uh, he was troubled and worried about that, but he follows it with verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. You know, so that's the truth. God will always lead us in the triumph. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one an aroma from death to death and another aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. You know, our motivation always has to be our love for him. You know, we, we love those that are being saved. We love, you know, those that are, that are lost. But, you know, in sincerity in our heart, it always comes back to our appreciation and our love for the Lord because we sanctified him as first in our heart. And in closing, I just wanted to read a small section out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Chapter 13. Notice verse 5. Love does not seek its own. It is not provoked and does not take into an account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. 
you know, our, our, the hope that keeps us anchored is we have the motivation to do that because of the love of God that he's poured out. It even says, you know, there's the explanation that it's been poured out in our hearts. And so, you know, in the same way that we're, we're going to be anchored to something, it's much better to anchor yourself, anchor yourself to the, the promise that God, he's not unjust, he's always good, and he's always present. He's always available. And so knowing that, you know, a person that knows that can have a tremendous effect for the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm.